there seems to be no reason today why we should have public clocks because everybody has accurate time on their wrists, um, digital time, and so time is not something that, that, that we sort of need anymore. So it struck me that if you were going to make a public clock, you've got to make an entertainment. You've got to make something that people want to stand by and wait by. And you say when you're shopping to someone you're supposed to be meeting, I'll meet you by the clock at about 10 o'clock. And that person who may have to spend five minutes, 10 minutes, half an hour there, <laughs> can be entertained whilst they're waiting. The Telford Centre is a shopping centre, much like any other shopping centre, with the same sort of shops that you find in all shopping centres. But there are some delightful details that have been built into it. There are wonderful tiles and ironwork and little bits of woodwork which have come from the locality in which it's built. Telford is a new town but it's very close to Ironbridge, which was the birth of the Industrial Revolution. And it is in Ironbridge that you can see the Iron Bridge, which was the first cast iron bridge. But many other things can be seen there as well. It's a sort of industrial museum. And so in designing the clock to go in the Telford Centre, it was thought that the design ought to reflect the ideas of the Industrial Revolution and engineering of that period as well. So I tried to design within that vernacular and using cast iron and ceramics and that sort of Victorian massiveness everywhere. The initial concept of the clock, that is what it should do, what it should represent and how it should do it and the illusion and those sort of very abstract things have to be thought of all in one go. And I like to sort of take myself away, walk the dog and not sleep and not eat and just work and work, just thinking for three or four days until I've, I've got what it's all about. That's the easy part in a way. From then on, you've got to get down and work out how each little bit is going to work. Although it's my job to come up with a concept, an exciting idea, a conjuring trick or whatever, I'm not the man who's going to sit down and make it. I have to get a team around me who understand what I'm about and can be responsible for their own parts of the job and yet all the time refer to my idea. Andy Bazant is an engineer who I feel I can really work with because he thinks very much like I do, which is a very different way to how most engineers and designers think today. Almost everything that is designed today is designed for mass production. And when you design for mass production, you think in a totally different way than when you're making a one-off. When I was a boy, I worked with an old man who was the most wonderful designer. And he impressed upon me how you make one-offs. He said to me, in your life, you're not going to be making millions of anything. You are a one-off person. Work in this way. Throw away the ruler and try to do a minimum amount of drawing. This is how you work. You make the whole object from beginning to end in your mind. And then you go back and you make it again in your mind, trying to think of what must be made first. Once you've made the first thing, then the second thing is fitted to it. And the next thing is fitted to that. And you keep working in your mind until you get to a point when it doesn't work. You can't fit this to this because you haven't made this yet. That makes you go back to the beginning and start making it again in your mind. And you do this over and over again until you can run right through the whole thing and make it in your mind. All the time, one should be aware there might be a wonderful idea just around the corner and you need to be able to incorporate that. And that's why it's so good working with Andrew because he brings his own ideas into it as well. It's just wonderful to work with him because of that extra input. 
interesting feature about a project like this is that it's the combination of organic and mechanical so that things on the outside look like they are organic leaves and frogs and so on inside they're all cogs and wheels the main engineering work on the clock wasn't made in a factory it was made in a barn in the quiet countryside that was wonderful for doing the work but when it came to shifting the pieces from the barn to get them to the shopping centre, we realised that the lorry couldn't get to the farm. The lorry that was big enough to carry it couldn't get to the farm. So wheels had to be put on, on parts of the clock and it wheeled through the country lanes until we could get to the lorry. Whilst the clock was being wheeled along the country lanes, it had its first public exposure. Push it, pull it over towards you a bit. It's going to central again, that's it. It's funny because it's the only left in the ground, it goes one way, it didn't go to the other. Yeah, well, it's a camber on the, yeah. on the road that's um, making it go. I mean, we've got a fair bit of weight here, really. Yeah. You know it's on wheels. It's... As the manufacturer progresses, there are little problems that occur and there are little ideas that need to be included. The main illusion in the clock is that there is a ball that is created at one end of the clock that travels through the clock through various means to the other end of the clock. And when the uh, clock was first designed, the ball was intended to be a plastic ball uh, which was gold in colour. And so many parts of the clock got made with that in mind. But as uh, the production was going on, it was decided that the ball should not be plastic at all, but a large metal ball, a brass ball, gold-plated. In most applications in the clock, it is only half balls or captive balls, so it, it didn't matter. But in one place, there was like a cascade, a, a waterfall, where the, where the ball continued down and bounced through this succession of little shelves and, and back into the clock. And that was the only place where you saw and knew that it was a real ball. When the metal ball was put into this part of the clock, it banged and clattered its way all the way through and came out hexagonal. So we had to try and think of a way of smoothly allowing a heavy metal ball to pass through this bit of the clock. And so I took the, the original drawing which gave me all the dimensions of where the ball should go, where it should come out of the clock, round and round and round and back in again, and designs a system which could make the ball pass smoothly. So the ball passes in the top here and runs down this shelf. Its weight pulls that shelf down until it stops. It runs across to the next shelf. Its weight then moves this one down which rolls across here. Down, 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 down all the way to the bottom until it rolls back into the clock. That way the ball is never jumping off anywhere and, is, and, and runs very smoothly through. Having made this, con this cardboard um, drawing, if you like, or cardboard model of how it should work, uh, I then had to make a wooden one to see if it worked. So this uh, is a one-fifth scale of the real thing and then I can put a marble in the top and it comes out of one part of the clock and into this new system and is gently passed this way and that until it gets to the bottom and goes back into the clock. We have also made a
scale sized can of coke but if that is thrown into any part of the system it won't cause the ball to fall out into a baby's pram uh, the, the ball just keeps going or, if, or in some places where you place a coke can it just stops it but it never the ball never falls out it, it just either keeps going or, or it stops and you go and take the, coca can, the can of coke out working with a team each person in that team has their own job to do they need really only think of their part but I have to try always to keep the whole job in mind, the colour of things, the shape of things and so on, not just how they work, so that there is a continuity throughout, so that when it's finished, you look at it and you can see how everything fits together in a very simple way, as if one man just did it. You only want half a thousand, or whatever, even closing down on balls, you say. And that's your problem. But anyway, don't despair. Well, I, for a second or yeah, two. Yeah, okay. uh, a shopping centre is like a ship. It's always moving, there's always people moving around. There's air conditioning thumping away. and So that if you want to do something that nobody can see, if you want to do something in secret, something big, the only time you can do it is when the shopping centre closes on Saturday night and it's got to be all done and cleared up by Monday morning. Although the clock was manufactured elsewhere, it had to fit into its designated place in the shopping centre. And when those huge bolts were put in, they fitted perfectly. Absolute magic. This is quite exciting because this is the first time in two years that I'm able to see the clock in the space it was designed for. When it was in the barn, you couldn't get far enough away from it to see how it was going to look, and the light was all wrong and everything. This space is an amazing space, with light and air and reflections and reflected sound. It's so different from the place it was made, and it's looking good. To be able to hang four tons of clock from the ceiling, you need to talk to the architect. Architecture is not just the form and the size of buildings and the roads that come to them and so on. It's all the little nitty gritty, the, the shape and the size of tiles, door handles and little things like that. And in this case, to add a real sparkle to the clock we decided that the face of the clock should be made of traditional ceramic tiles. And the best place to have them made was the Jackfield Tile Works. The making of tiles in this traditional way is a very labour-intensive job, handwork dipping and hand painting and squeezing of liquids and so on. Along with all the handwork, there are machines that are banging and thumping away. And they're very interesting looking machines. I wonder if it's possible to incorporate some of this in the clock. There's some wonderful things going on here in this tile museum. For me, this point is very exciting because, as a painter, I normally do everything myself. I do the drawing, the painting, the making of the frame, and everything is all done by me. But in the case of making these tiles, I did a drawing and then coloured it with watercolour and, and gave it over to someone else. 
And months later, suddenly, there was this wonderful interpretation of my little painting into these beautiful tiles. I'm staggered at how wonderful it looks. So, and I'll set fire to it. What, what, what have we got to <laughs> You hold it in your teeth. Yes. <laughs> what material is this, Steve? A very important it task that the architect has to carry out is to make sure that all the materials used pass the safety regulations. And so things have to pass the fire chief and his extremely technical tests that have to be done on things. And the wood has to be the right sort of wood that won't easily burn. And even the paint on the surface of everything has to be the right paint. If, you've got, if they can easily provide the certs, yes. um, just send them through. In this day and age, it's very difficult to find a real, old-fashioned, traditional sign writer. A man who can pick up a brush and just draw a straight line without having to mark it first or use masking tape or pieces of string. You can just draw a straight gold line. Someone who is very fluent, has done it for years and years and can just decorate things. We were so lucky to find Mr. Dern. This clock is so big and there's so much work for the sign writer to do. There were times when it was almost as if he were preparing an exhibition for a gallery. There's a huge fan of leaves and although we could have just made up leaves, any old leaves would have done, it was decided that we should use real leaves and that they should be painted botanically correctly. It's absolutely essential that the whole clock should be decorated by one man, by one hand, so that almost like handwriting, right the way from one end to the other, you can see one man's hand, one man's work. Having decorated the clock completely, all over and beautifully, little things go wrong and things get scuffed and trodden on. So the decorator has to come back and do lots of things again. The overall design of the whole decoration had to look Victorian. It had to look as if it were a railway train from the Great Western Railway. The Telford clock is so special that instead of having what one would normally expect to hear, a sort of mechanical jingle that went off every hour, we thought it was very important that a special piece of music should be composed just for this clock. I've known Kit for a number of years now. I wasn't surprised when he rang me up and said he was doing another clock because his one in Cheltenham is so popular. So um, he came over here and showed me some diagrams and we threw a few ideas around. He took me on a tour of various people who were working on the clock, uh, sign painters and took me over to the pig farm where they were assembling it, which is <laughs> quite an interesting experience. And I came up with a few ideas. Uh, yeah, this is the uh, sort of thing we've been doing today. This is the section with Imogen here, uh, singing the main verse, if I can get it to play. That's a good. There's that B again. <laughs> that B. <laughs> That doesn't sound at all like it's supposed to because we've got a B that seems to have invaded the, the song as a result of having to do 
some transposition. And with a, a um, on this keyboard, I've got all sorts of natural sounds spread across. There's a raven there, frogs. And here is a B, you see. And that note shouldn't be playing, but I just happen to have transposed the whole piece of music by mistake. And so that's playing instead of that. You see. <laughs> so that explains what the B is. Anyway, so we've been, uh, we had a very successful session, I think. Mm. At that point, the pendulum is halfway down the gantry. And it's telling us now that something's going to be happening. And that the bellows will be. This is like sort of warning that the bellows music is coming out. What we're interested in doing today is running the clock as it would run on the hour to fit, to fit the music to the hour. And the, the music has been written, or a piece of music has been written that that can be adjusted time ways to and fro. But the clock has now been timed so that it runs, it, it does its thing on the hour. So we now got to try and fit the two together. And Terry then will be able to go away and make sure that it all flows through from one point to another. And I'll have something to work with because I'll have a picture of it actually running. Yeah. 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 But the whole thing is computer run, but it has to look like it's not computer run, it has to look like that every little bit is being switched on by what happened just before. And that's how the music will fit into it as well. The frog is the living part of this clock. He is the life. He has to have a real personality because he is the driver of the clock and the keeper of time. The frog's character is very important and I didn't want him just to be a sweet frog or a garden gnome of a sort of frog. He needed to have a very strong character. And I thought if I sat down and drew something and then asked someone else to make it, that's possibly not the best way of doing it. So what I did was to take David, the sculptor who was going to make the frog, the finished frog, and give him a description of the frog man, so to speak, that I wanted him to be. And so I said to him, all his clothes are made in Savile Row. He is pompous. He sees himself as a frog of the people. He thinks only of himself, but says he thinks only of his constituents. But he calls his secretary Sweetie. The methods used in making this frog are very traditional sculptural methods. First off, you have to make a clay maquette. That's a little model about eight inches high of exactly what the frog will look like with all its character and all its feelings in it. Once you've got everything correct in the maquette, the model, you then have to transfer all that information into the full-size sculpture, which you make in clay, and then take a plaster mould from it, break the mould open, and in the inside surface of the plaster mould, you then apply the glass fibre, very much in the same way that modern glass fibre boats are made. All that's left now in David's greenhouse are bits of the broken plaster cast, the clay was all picked out and that's gone and, and is back to clay. The glass fibre frog is finished and is painted and looking wonderful and there's just a few bits of the plaster mould left. Having made the big shiny frog that sits on top of the clock and blows his bubbles, we thought it'd be really nice if people come in to the centre and seeing the clock could go away with a little something. And so David has made these little miniatures of the great frog that people can buy and take away with them. The clock, with all its beautiful engineering, has to be decorated with paint. And 
in some places like the gold balls are gold plated but there is something magical about gold leafing. Gold leaf is wonderfully traditional. It's been used on architecture since the ancient Egyptians used it on their buildings and I just wanted somewhere to use gold leaf and so we decided that the rays of the sun should be done in gold leaf. We're here at Butterill Farm in Newley in Gloucestershire and we're putting 23 karat gold which has been put on transfer leaf like Letraset um, to make it easier for us and we're just putting it on like so and rubbing the back of it um, and then it's because they're rather nice snaky shapes it works rather well turning the leaf to fit the curve as you go round and Previously, before obviously we put the leaf on, we put some gold size on, which is rather like a varnish. But the advantage is its drying time has been very carefully um, sorted out with the ingredients. So we've actually put on a 12 hour size. I put it on the size at 11 o'clock last night. And we started work this morning a little bit earlier because it's very hot and the size is just dry and that's really the only skill now this sort of oil gilding um, with the help of transfer leaf it's become so easy just working like lecture set but the timing is pretty critical because if you put it on too soon um, it's wrinkles and the size never dries properly underneath the leaf and if you push it on too late well then the, the gold won't stick at all. Although the clock looks like a Victorian machine in which everything acts and reacts, that there's cause and effect, that as one thing happens it makes the next thing happen which then makes the next thing happen and so on. Although it looks like that, and that's how I designed it to look, and that's how I thought about it in my mind when I designed it. It is in fact operating in a completely different way. It is run by a computer program which takes account of every second of the day and decides what is to be done then and what is to be done in the next second. Jim not only did all the wiring in the clock, the miles and miles of electrical wiring and the air tubes that carry all the compressed air that do the functions in the clock, okay. he also wrote the long and extensive one. program that takes care of every second that the clock is switched on. Using a written program, the whole process is extremely flexible so that right up until the last moment the program can be changed and you can say well we'll have an extra few seconds here before this happens or take a few seconds off this or we can adjust the time this takes to happen to fit with the music and vice versa. When the clock is finished and winched into position you haven't got to be able to see all that wiring and all that control and so the wires and, and the pipes that carry compressed air have to be fed into the girders like the umbilical cord. The clock is born and has its cord connected instead of being cut. The grand illusion in the clock is that a ball is constantly passing from one end of the clock to the other but never comes back. It is as if there were thousands of balls waiting at one end to be transferred to the other end. No one will ever see, or we hope that no one will ever see, these tricks, the conjuring tricks of the illusion.
the wondrous Telford Time Machine. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 